Let's go ahead and get ourselves started. So welcome one and all. Uh, this is Glenn Katz checking in with you and we are joined with se by several guests, one of which will be joining us again in just a second as we work through some of the technical hitches. Um, today's topic is all about using visualizations and how to go ahead and create really stunning visualizations and incorporate them into your design process. And to help us talk about this topic today, this is really the second of our uh, AEC learning webinar series. You know, to help us talk about this specific topic, we brought on a couple of very special guests. Okay, who is already on the line with us is Professor Ming Tang of the University of Cincinnati. Ming is someone whose work I've admired for many years. I follow a lot of examples. He has a lot of good stuff posted out there online, uh, examples of the fantastic visualizations he does. And he's going to go ahead and actually share a lot of his work with us a little bit later in the webcast. Actually, Ming, uh, just as we get started, you're gonna go, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Just like uh, let the folks know who you are. Hi, everyone. My name is Ming Tang. I'm teaching at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, I have been using Autodesk uh, product since uh, 1997. So today I'm really glad to have this opportunity to be here and share some of my experience and thoughts with everyone. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, in just a minute we're going to be joined by Mr. Chris Peterson, who's one of our student experts from the uh, Penn State. He's also going to be sort of showing some of his work. He's a third year architecture student, so hopefully someone you can relate to, someone who's doing things very similar to what you're doing in the studio these days. And we're going to be talking a lot about how we're using visualization kind of in the design studios and some of the really cool advanced things he's pushing ahead with. Okay, so really just to set the stage and get us going with this whole process, we're talking about visualization and really Ming and I in preparation were thinking a little bit about just really, oh, you know, how the process of visualization has really changed quite a bit through the years. You know, when Ming and I were first getting started with doing a lot, a lot of our architectural design work and doing visualization, we used to have a process that involved you do your design work, you keep on working and kind of completing the design, and then really towards the end of the process, you go ahead and finally set up the materials, the lighting, all the things you need to do to create a final rendering, something that you put on your final boards and present. And the reason you sort of did it this way is that it took a long time. You'd set everything up and it would really just take hours and hours. Set up the parameters, you might as well just go home and wait overnight. And at the end of that whole process, you'd end up with a little postage stamp, 800 by 600, little static image of your design. And it took all night to do that. And it was really a very slow process. So we didn't do a very good job of incorporating visualization into what we did day in and day out. Okay, now things have changed very radically, and that's really what today's webcast is all about. We want to think about you know, not only the tools that let us sort of uh, visualize things much more quickly and help inform our design process so that now as part of design we can incorporate just really what the visual appearance, the materials, the lighting, the, the mood and the feeling of the experience is going to be like right in the process but also that let us really start to engage other people because visualization is very powerful if we can share our design with other people who need to approve, buy in, and ultimately participate in the design process more effectively, we'll really just have a much better design process. So that's really the high level about what we're about today. So along those lines, we'll go ahead and talk about uh, uh, Revit and some of the visualization tools in there. We're going to be looking at a tool called uh, Present or Showcase, excuse me, Autodesk Showcase, which is a very good presentation tool. And we'll also talk about 3ds, uh, Max, as well as Maya. Okay, here comes Chris. He's coming back online. Nice about that. Oh, no worries. Let me go ahead and get your yourself yourself in just a second here. And in terms of like, uh, just we're, we're just setting the stage right now, just so you know what's going on to get you caught up. Um, yeah. Um, Let's go ahead and yeah, have you introduce yourself right now, and then we'll get started kind of like diving on into this. Uh, so Chris, we told him a little bit about you in terms of yourself being a, like a third year architecture student at Penn State, and how you really focus on visualization and a lot of the work you do in the studio. Anything you want to share to get us started? Sure. Um, well, my name's Chris. Um, I am originally from the Chicago area, just a brief background, and I go to Penn State, and I'm in the architecture program, and I'm a third year. Um, and um, Pretty much what I do is, um, my, my main interest in studio is uh, communicating my ideas as effectively as I can. Um, and in doing so, I've developed rendering skills and uh, just trying to communicate my ideas as clearly as possible, which have uh, actually really helped me a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm currently in the, um, just the end phases of the project right now. Um, I've completed my presentation boards, and I am 
we currently just entered the, uh, the final modeling phase of our project. Okay, so we'll go ahead and show your project in just a little bit. Let me go ahead and start by just like uh, getting everyone set up. In terms of what is going on here, just so uh, the, the students who are watching through the FaceCast know, this is meant to be a very interactive session. It really is a round table where we have brought what we hope are sort of like some really interesting people together to talk with you about this. But talking is really an important piece of this. So if you can, like uh, connect and chat through the whole Facebook page or directly through the Procaster chat stream. But go ahead and start like like uh, just engaging in the conversation. If you have things you want to see, if you have comments or questions, yeah, jump right in there and join in the discussion. This will be a whole lot more interesting if you're involved in it too, so that we're not just kind of presenting things. So please, yeah, it's all about kind of engaging that conversation. Jump in and don't be shy. We'll try to answer questions as they come on in and just really make sure this is a meaningful and worthwhile time for you guys too. Okay, so last a way of just getting started, let me go ahead and I'm going to like just, you know, I'll start with Revit and we can talk about just really right within the modeling environment some of the things that we can do just with visualization to get ourselves started that really kind of speed up the whole process and make it a lot easier to get going. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for just a second and as I'm doing this, uh, you know, Ming and Chris, feel free to kind of chime in at any point in the whole process. but. I'm basically looking at just Revit now, right now, uh, the Revit application. Let me go ahead and kind of pop that up, make that a little bit bigger so it feels a little more of the screen. And really what we're going, looking at here is this is kind of the, oh, the type of visualization that you get right within the uh, modeling environment where what we're seeing here is just sort of a shaded view. Uh, with a, a little bit of effect of the lighting in here, but it's really mostly kind of colors. We're not really seeing the textures right now. And what's happening is just right within the modeling environment, we can start to get some feedback about what's going on, but it's really just sort of the beginning. But what I wanted to kind of share with you, and what I'm trying to do is just sort of move my taskbar around so that uh, oh, I can sort of like uh, get to the things that I want to show you. I'll pop that over here. Okay. is that really we introduced some features last year that sort of started making visualization a little bit easier. For example, this is the shaded view. One thing that we added last year was the whole notion of a realistic view. So if we turn on realistic view, what happens is we're starting to see the beginning of what I'd call a rendering. And here what we're doing is pulling the materials, so the material definitions, the photo uh, bitmaps that should be rendered on top of those materials, and displaying them sort of right within the, the 3D view. Now, this is not accurate in terms of lighting and all the ray tracing and shadow and a lot of things that we'd like to do as we keep on going. But even as a starting point, this is kind of interesting in terms of being able to start to see kind of what the uh, effect or the actual visual effect is going to be you know, of your model. And you know, the nice thing about doing that, it didn't really involve a whole lot of post-processing. Post I pretty much just switched over to a new viewing mode. And I was able to kind of very quickly get some feedback on the materials, the colors, and start to understand my model. Now, this is actually something for people who watched last week. Angela showed us a little bit, Angela Chan, who sort of introduced that feature. You know, some of the other ones that are kind of related to it are, even within Revit right now, there's this whole idea of there's that blue sky background, which isn't really very interesting in the scheme of things. It's just kind of a simple gradient right now. But by looking at the graphic display options, we now actually have the ability to do things like switch from a gradient background to more of an image background. Let me kind of show you what that would look like. So if I chose the image and I'll customize the image, I can choose some sort of image, a photograph that I have on my hard drive somewhere or that I pulled off the web. I'll say OK. And when I apply that, okay, I can very quickly start getting all sorts of interesting visual effects. Whether I want to show this building at sunset, okay, sort of a dusky sunset, and the image isn't really quite appropriate for the what I'm being what I'm displaying there right now, or if I'd like to go through and do something like let me choose a different image, I'll go out there to my desktop. Hang on just a second. Take a look at some things out there. Oh, we'll put this kind of in context. So another thing we can do is actually just place it in a setting. If you have a cityscape or some buildings around that you want to include, I'll put this house out in the mountains. So I'll say OK. okay, And try to do some sort of very quick matching of sort of images with some visual uh, feedback in the background just to kind of make it a little bit better. So you know the important thing that I'm trying to stress here is that really there's a lot of cool things we can do right within Revit without even leaving that modeling environment to start getting some visual feedback. 
And actually, even along these lines, I think that like uh, you know Ming and Chris, I think you you both have some sort of interesting examples of things that we actually you know just have done right within the Revit environment. So like like Ming, do you have anything you want to share in terms of like uh, you know some things that were really kind of rendering enhancements that you know you did right within Revit without having to go to some of the other visualization tools? Yes, we have some of the examples uh, from a project last quarter. No worries. Let, let me go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen, and then you can go ahead and share your screen and like uh, take off and just uh, show us uh, some of the, the kind of cool things and see if we can get some questions. All right. Can you see my screen now? Um, I think it's coming. There you go. All right. Uh, so I can show some of the project is uh, totally rendered in uh, in Revit. Um, I think this is. Uh, uh, it is a combination of actually multiple software. So basically, this is a real project. Uh, we worked with Parkinson Wheel uh, last quarter. It's a 10 story high building in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So the challenge is we need to redesign the building skin uh, to reflect some of the uh, uh, environmental sustainable design ideas. So quickly, the students had this conceptual model in Revit and then build the materials and lighting is really quick. Uh, then you can see the renderings actually show the different type of uh, uh, skin model. I can show this in the full screen. Now for, uh, for the someone... original model, yeah, can you see the? Oh, yeah, no, can it's, it's the... kind of coming up. So we're, we're looking okay. at uh, like the, uh, the, the rendering of the uh, 3D section cut, which is really kind of very compelling for understanding how the building is being built. Yes, because one of the uh, key issues about the skin is we want to see how exactly these skins will look like from the you know the sections, even in the different lighting conditions. We rendered the cloudy day, sunny day. We even tried the different materials. So some of the material make the skin more translucent, and some Actually, of them will give give more yeah. opacities. Qu question for you on that, because I think people sort of wonder about in terms of custom materials. As, as you're creating custom materials, like do you uh, you know get them from photographic images, or do you create your own sort of images in a photo editing tool, or yeah, you know, how do you sort of create some of those different materials and map them to the skin? Well, it's a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, we use the default material library in Revit, uh, so you can actually control the transparency values of this material directly. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, if you are looking for a particular color or patterns or textures, you are using Photoshop and then project that image directly into the skin. So this is a combination of a little bit everything. Uh, so what you see here is some of the direct renderings uh, within Revit. Uh, we did this through the Revit cloud rendering. So it's really fast. Uh, it, it's very quick. You can get this result uh, without actually wait hours, days uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to see the final result. So uh, we also actually tried some of other approach transfer to other programs, but I guess we can talk about this later with you know, 3DS sure. Max and Maya. Now, now, a question that kind of came up, uh, Carlos online is asking, he has a question about the best computer for doing uh, Revit and renderings, and he's wondering if there's a difference in terms of Macs or PCs or if we have any recommendations on that. So, like, uh, yeah, from my perspective, yeah, I'm someone who actually mixes environments. I work on PCs and Macs and run uh, Revit under, like, parallels. I tend to do it just in a virtualization environment, although we could do it in boot camp if we wanted to get the full like you know, processing power available for Revit. Like in your experience, do you do everything on PCs or do you do a little bit of mixed or like yeah, what are you using on your side just from a platform standpoint? Uh, we use both. We have Mac in the lab. We also have PC. I feel the uh, the uh, hardware requirement in Autodesk website is very useful. Basically, yeah. if there are students want to buy a new machine, we always refer them to go to Autodesk website. So they can read all the requirements like a CPU memories. It's very helpful. Fantastic. Actually, it was a fantastic image that just went by a second ago showing transparency through the screen. That was actually very, very nice in terms of what's going on there. Excellent. OK. Uh, Chris, how about on your side in terms of just doing some very basic rendering stuff like uh, in, in Revit? Do you have any like examples that kind of like show like what we could actually do before we take it out? Or like, you know? Um, yeah. There's um, actually what's new with 2013, which I um, just downloaded a few days ago, 
It's the um, ray tracing feature. Oh, cool. Feature so, so go ahead and show us that. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll share the screen. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, it's working, right? Um, yes, we're looking at your Revit screen. OK, great. Uh, so I'll just uh, use the sample project again. Fantastic. Um, so, so Glenn showed the realistic um, viewport option, which is um, pretty good at estimating what the materials would look like. You, sh you see the material images. Um, I'll just go to that now. Um, like the stone here on the where the fireplace would be, you get more detail out of that, which is which is great. Um, but the next step, which is which I think is pretty cool, is um, so with the 2012 uh, 3ds Max release, they um, I, uh, an engine called iRay was introduced, um, and that's basically an iterative render where it does keeps doing render passes and refines the the image progressively. And um, what's new in 2013 in Revit, which um, I think is pretty cool, is this ray trace option right underneath realistic. So if you click on that, it will um, take a little bit to load um, the, the features in the engine. But once it gets going, you'll see how um, it's just really blurry at first, and then it'll just immediately start refining the image in just basically render passes. Um, oh, fantastic. So that's like really what we have done as a post, like we've had to go to the special rendering dialogue and, you know, kind of do that as a separate process. It looks like it's sort of just doing it in real time. Yeah, it's um, it's a really really cool feature that um, just I discovered from uh, just downloading twenty thirteen pretty much. Um, Fantastic. Okay, so just so people know, in terms of the twenty thirteen releases, those are actually available out there on the Autodesk Student website right now. So I'll show you that link in a little while. But if you go to students.autodesk.com, you can download Revit Architecture twenty thirteen and kind of get access to that feature today. Cool. Actually, Ming, you brought up sort of an interesting thing. You mentioned kind of quickly in passing the whole notion of the cloud rendering service. So, like, let's talk about that a little bit in terms of what that buys, as opposed to kind of waiting on your machine to sort of set up a rendering and let it kind of cook away for quite a while and tying up your machine so you can't do anything else with it. Like, yeah, tell us how you're using sort of cloud rendering and what that's really gonna you know help the students achieve, as opposed to waiting around for the renderings to happen. Sure, I think one of the benefits of cloud rendering is it releases the burden you have to do all the renderings computations in your local machine, which you cannot you know, use it for other things. So cloud rendering actually really makes us have more time to actually concentrate on the design without worry too much. I have to reserve some of the days for rendering. So cloud rendering can actually push the entire project into the into the Autodesk server, so the server will handle all the renderings in a very, very quick way. One example is uh, we typically have 10 weeks. Uh, we have a quarter system here in Cincinnati. So students, they have to kind of complete the design in a week eight, mm -hmm. and they have two weeks reserved just for the renderings, compositions, graphic to the presentation board. That was the situation without the cloud rendering. But when uh, there's one quarter we introduce cloud renderings, we actually can allow the design phase be much longer, even be like nine weeks, only need a few days for the students for cloud rendering. And you handle mm -hmm. the images really fast. You can get hundreds, hundreds of renderings from the entire class, and then they can pick the ideal one for the final composition. Fantastic. So we push it out to some servers, some Autodesk servers. They run all the processing in the background for us. And then just when the renderings are done, we get notified? Exactly. You will have an email, and you, you can just download the image directly from the server. It's very convenient. Fantastic. Now, Angela told us a little bit last week about that. There's actually some cool new views available in the cloud rendering, too, where as opposed to just static images, we actually have the ability now to do panoramas. So you can put a camera down and actually do a little 360 sweep, which gives users a kind of, you know, you can sort of have more of an interactive, like, walk through where you can turn your head and kind of look around, not just at the still thing, but you can actually sort of yeah. see what's happening around you a little bit. And I think yeah. that would be extremely helpful for the interior design as well. 
you can actually go into the space and see all the every single angles. Beautiful. And even, you know, one thing Ming and I have talked about about in terms of what we're really excited about, how visualization is changing, is this notion that, you know, it's, but we're, we're now allowing people to more interact with and experience the space. So being able to kind of put yourself in the space and not just sort of look at a snapshot, but actually kind of be in the space and pivot your head and look around at the things you want to, really, it, it helps engage people when you're trying to get them involved in the design process. Fantastic. Okay. So now, in terms of like a cloud rendering, just so people know, yeah, as a student, when you log on in and you have a students.autodesk.com account, um, you'll get with 75 rendering units. So let's talk about what that means. Because that isn't sort of 75 renderings per se. What happens is it's actually sort of scaled based on the complexity of what it is you're trying to render. So if you have kind of a relatively quick rendering that doesn't take up too much, it's really based on processing time. It doesn't take up too much processing time. That could be one unit. If you go ahead and you sort of ratchet everything up to the best quality presentation settings and do everything at 1,200 dots an inch, that may use up five of the rendering units. So you have to be a little bit careful about how you use them. They're a great resource to kind of free you up at the last minute so you're not having to like, oh, go into the lab, put a piece of paper over the machine that says, please do not disturb, and hope, beyond hope, that somehow, I see you're laughing, Ming, because it's, oh, yeah, same with you. Of course, we've all been there, where you go to the lab and that, that, that machine's there, and like uh, often people don't respect uh, the fact that you do it that way. So cloud rendering is much, much safer. Send it off that way. Uh, something to take advantage of. But if you do use up all your units, we can go back to using kind of the more conventional rendering tools too, just doing it right within Re and Revit or uh, taking it to some of the other tools. OK, fantastic. OK, what, what I'd love to do next is go ahead and kind of shift over to kind of a really cool way of interacting with projects that I really want to make uh, people uh, kind of aware of. OK, I'm looking at some of the questions, make sure we're answering things. OK, and uh, one of these things is a tool called Showcase, which is really sort of a very immersive way of presenting things. So let me kind of tell you a little bit about how it works. OK, if you stop sharing, and I'll pick up the baton on this end. We'll give people a real quick idea of how it works. And I'll share my desktop. And here's basically the idea. I am over here in Revit. I've got my model. It's looking pretty good in terms of what I want over here. What I can do if I'd like to sort of take it to showcase, this visualization application, lets us do very quick kind of playing with materials and interacting with the model. I can export the model on this side as an FBX file, which a lot of you would recognize as a way that we actually take it over to 3D Studio Max or other tools. FBX is sort of a very common format for actually uh, exchanging files. Actually, Chris or Ramin, what does FBX stand for? Do you know offhand? Not offhand, no. Ah, we stumped all the experts. As a, I don't remember offhand either. I, it's, it's, you know, it's, it somehow makes an awful lot of sense. I'll, I'll learn not to ask leading questions when I don't know the answer either. I was hoping one of you guys would. Okay, but what happens is when we bring a model in to showcase as an FBX file, you actually get something, and what we did over here is I just did an import, and I imported the FBX file. And let's take a look at what's actually happened to the model. Here the model is. It's over here in showcase. I can orbit around, kind of take a look at it. I hope you, as you're sort of looking at it in showcase, you're sort of seeing that's a pretty high quality uh, visualization of what things you're looking at. It's actually much higher quality than what we get right within Revit in terms of what's going on. But where, where Showcase really shines and where it's really quite fantastic, let me move on in or move on out, or I could even sort of move into the building. I could walk on in there and do something. Get inside the space. Is that for going ahead and taking a look at what I'll call, oh, almost like real-time rendering, it's very, very powerful. So for example, you're looking at the materials mapped on the objects very much like they would have been mapped in a sort of realistic mode. What I can do is actually just select an object. For example, I'll select those walls, or I'll select that brick that's on the fireplace, or the stone that's on the fireplace, or the concrete over here. And you see those little holodeck-like uh, like grids appear on things. If I want to select all the objects with this material, I can grab them all. And what is really fantastic about doing this is, let me go ahead and bring up the little material library. I can go through and pull up some materials. So for example, if I want to say, what would the effect be of all those being, oh, some particular type of brick, I can just basically choose the brick and it will map it right on there. Or choose this decorative brick or block. Or choose kind of this fire glaze brick. 
Or if I don't want to do brick and I want to look at stone, I can go ahead and cover it all with some sort of castle stone or something like that. And the nice thing about this is it's just very, very quick, very, very easy. For example, right now I have the ground. If I want to put cobbles all over the ground, or put asphalt all over the ground, or put the grass back all over the ground, there's really, it's pretty hard to beat the quickness of what I'm doing right there. And just as sort of something to facilitate design exploration, like boy, it's, you know, there's nothing that's really quite that kind of quick and interactive for really understanding and starting to explore the models. Okay. Another really cool feature showcase I want to let you know, because I love it in terms of doing material exploration, that's kind of a very cool thing, is this whole notion of actually creating more of an immersive environment. So here's the idea. I got that model there. It's looking OK, but it's looking a little uh, blank. It's kind of sitting out there in a big white field of uh, not much context. And I'd love to kind of give it some context. So what I can do is actually go through and add to it. Oh, i got to find it. where it is in here. It's uh, environment library. I'm going to go ahead and place this someplace. I can place it in a grassy field. I can place it on a country road or out in the middle of the desert. I can choose some of these different environments. Let me choose that. It'll put it out there. I've now got that model in that environment. Let me go ahead and kind of orbit it around. And I actually have context now, so I can start to see what that model looks like in that context. If this house isn't really destined for that sort of environment, if it's really de more destined to be out in the desert, I can go ahead and apply more of a desert scene to it. Okay, this one's going to take a little bit of adjustment. It's that this scene is a little tight, so I'm going to sort of expand the scene a little wider. I'm going to make it just a, a little bit bigger. So I can drop it in there, say okay to that. Some other things I may want to do after I drop this model into the scene, actually I'll go back to the grass field. That's a little bit easier to see in terms of coloration, just in terms of what's happening on my screen here. I may need to go ahead and do a little bit of adjustment. For example, since I now have a ground plane coming in their immersive environment, I may need to go ahead and just take out some of these. All I'm going to do is backspace to get rid of some of those things. And in that same sense, if I want to, I can go to the scene settings and, oh, let me go ahead and just sort of basically bring the ground plane up so that the ground plane, this house was actually sort of built on top of more of a, like a hill. So I need to kind of raise it up a little bit to kind of actually set it down in the ground. Okay, so now I start having just really kind of a very kind of almost playful environment in terms of working with it. So it really is kind of just a fantastic tool for very quickly getting some sorts of visualizations. We can store some shots. In fact, actually, let's go ahead and pass the baton on this one. I know, Ming, you've done some very kind of cool and interesting things with Showcase in terms of dynamic structures and things where we want to show several different states. How about you share some of those, share some of those with us? Sure. Uh, let me go ahead. Uh, I will... Uh, Pass the baton back to you. All right. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, you're you're up and yes, we see you now. All right. This is actually going back to that risking uh, studio to focus on the building facade. So this is one student project from John. Uh, he wanted to design a kinetic system. Uh, which uh, these building panels, these window panels, can uh, move uh, along the tracks, responding to the different solar radiation data. So this is a very complex concept, and uh, we are actually struggled uh, to actually communicate this idea with other people because it's a very complex kinetic system. So the solution we actually find out is transfer this model directly into the uh, the showcase. And this is the environment you can actually play with the different materials. You can actually keyframe the animation as well. So this is actually a very short video clips directly exported uh, from this showcase program. So you can mm -hmm. see this window panel is moving. Uh, you have this 360 degree rotation. You can see the, uh, the things from the, any angle you like. And more important, this is actually a real time rendering. So there's zero time for uh, calculate this actually, you know, you can immediately see the result when you manipulate these materials. So I feel this is really a powerful way compared with uh, the steel image, compared with the flash through animation. This is more like the video game. You have these rendering engines. 
So, so as you're interacting with clients, or as you're interacting with people, you're trying to explain the design. Like you can in showcase then just you know change those states from open blades to closed blades, and really give people the opportunity to kind of see and explore and play with it the way they want to. Exactly. We actually uh, we have a little bit discussion uh, uh, today is about how this interactivity is changing the nature of uh, the design. Uh, so as a designer, you are not necessarily uh, staying in your office and produce the final you know, project and then show the clients. The clients actually can sit right beside you and you can discuss these different design iterations. You can uh, think, well, maybe this material is better. We change the transparency, we change the color to this way. So it's really changed the nature of communication. Fantastic. Fantastic. Let me pick up a couple more questions that have come in that people were asking about. Uh, there's one. There's a lot of ish, ish questions about cloud units and how you get those. So you get the cloud units just by joining the Autodesk community. And I think it's actually up to 75 cloud units now. At least that's what uh, the Revit kid was reporting. So I think that actually is true now. In terms of, I don't think there are any render side limits. It's really just sort of the, the more complex you're rendering and really how much rendering time it takes up is really going to just determine like uh, how many cloud units you're consuming. So it's really just based on more the complexity of anything else. Um, what else? Hmm. OK. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan, for pointing that out. My screensaver came on, so I apologize to everyone on the other side who was like watching. That, that's what those weird ethereal clouds are. Thank you for like pointing that out. Okay, um, there was a question about just landscape design and which of these things might be most appropriate for them. So, like either from from Creos or for like, if, if you're rendering like a, like landscapes, do you have any sort of specific tips in terms of like things that are particularly useful, either like oh. You know, content types like oh, rich photorealistic content, or you know, just as you're trying to put in sort of plants and trees and do more landscape rendering. Do you have any sort of like uh, tips about how we approach that, either for Chris or for me? I'm just sort of curious. Um, well, I know Revit has um, the rich photorealistic realistic content um, in house. You could import that as a as a family, mm -hmm. and um, also 3ds Max has a uh, has a tree feature, I believe, um, yes. and uh, you can do all sorts of things with um, metal ray proxies if you want want to look into that. It's um, a pretty cool idea, and yeah, these trees they they have all the leaves and and cast the shadows that normal trees would with all the detail of the leaves and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and for like landscape for um, like topography, uh, I know that Revit does that pretty well actually. If you use um, just topographic lines um, to produce that, and then there's all sorts of grass materials. Um, I don't know, if, uh, Ming, you know any more about this? Well, that, I, I think there's one trick I would like to share is uh, sometimes the number of polygon of tree is more than the entire building, right? You have like a hundred <laughs> thousand. a lot of leaves, trees. yeah. Right. So the first thing you should think about is what is the purpose uh, to render the trees or the forest? Uh, typically, if the tree is really close to the camera, which you can have uh, this high polygon and highly detailed tree, I think that's a really good solution. But if the tree is really far away from the camera, it's kind of sort of build up the entire background. In that case, you can actually use the image um, using the alpha channel of the tree to map directly into a plan surface. So sure. it's a much quicker way for rendering. Yeah, much more efficient. You're not hitting all the processing time of time of doing every polygon for every leaf and casting every shadow. Yes. So really speeds it up. No, fantastic. Um, let's go ahead and oh, just because in the interest of time, let's go and switch topics around just a little bit in terms of what's going on. Another topic that we've all three talked about a little bit in preparation for this was this notion of it's really it's the type of imagery because sometimes you know we used to do this thing. I always used to think that I had to make photorealistic images. And the truth is, photorealistic isn't always best. In fact, if my design isn't very far along and I really want to engage people in discussion, 
you know, photorealistic may be actually off-putting in that it looks so finished, like, geez, you should have asked me whether I like the design before you uh, completed it, you know, it got me a little involved in the whole thing. So actually, you know, Ming showing some fantastic images now that I think are really more stylistic, which is really kind of a very nice effect to think about as opposed to being photorealistic. Actually, I mean, let's turn it over to Chris. Chris, I know you have some sort of interesting images in terms of, oh, we were looking at some that, you know, you know, sort of, you know, started with Revit, but then you, you did some nice stylistic things that uh, kind of encode context different than the foreground. And like, so, you know, see if you can show like that library project you were showing me earlier is one that I think would be really a fantastic one to share. Sure. Um, so I have a, this will be on my website online. Um, just so chrispeterson.weebly.com? Yep, that's Take it. note. It's, uh, it's a free, we free um, website, online website developing. I have to comment, your, your, your photograph's much nicer than any of mine, so I, I, I give you credit for that. <laughs> You're good on the marketing side. Uh, the, uh, well, yeah, so the, the project that uh, we looked at before was this library project that I'm in the, in the final phases of. Um, and uh, it's in Pittsburgh in the central north side area, which is um, kind of at a, a low and it's coming back as a community. Um, and so it's, it's basically a public library. And um, I modeled the entire project in 3ds Max. Um, the previous few projects I actually modeled using Revit, but this time I, try, I wanted to give it a little spin and uh, see what I could do with uh, such a freeform modeler as 3ds. Um, so I'll start off with, with uh, just with this page, in terms of actually uh, that, that first image, the the exterior image. Yeah, you know, I, I I like that one a lot. You know, going like a, yeah. You know, what's going on there? Um, okay, so this one is um, obviously night rendering, and what I did was when we, as a class, we visited our site. Um, we took a lot of photos, we um, talked to a few local people who um, know the area, know the developing buildings around the area, and um, so we took a lot of photos of the surroundings and where our building would be, um, because we all knew, um, because from previous projects, that many of us would do a rendering such as this, where we would render our, our building um, using either Revit or 3ds Max, and then insert that rendering into a photo of the site. Um, to give it context, uh, mm -hmm. which would really help uh, relate to the surroundings of what we're trying to do. So in this one, mm -hmm. um, the original photo was actually taken during the day, and then I kind of converted it, changed it a little around, changed it around a little bit um, to make it look like it's kind of a dusk time, um, mm -hmm. and I did my night rendering and, and basically inserted that into the image. So what I really like about this is it's sort of the contrast, as opposed to everything looking photo real. The, you know, the kind of stylized quality of the, your building versus the sort of dropped back quality of the background really makes you know, your building stand out. It's, 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 it's quite stunning to look at this. And I think what's nice is that, although it may not be photorealistic, I think for communicating your design and engaging discussion, it's probably actually much more useful than photorealistic. Um, yeah, so um, a lot of what we, what we do, at least in, uh, in my studio, is um, yeah, the photoreal photorealistic renderings look um, look very nice, but um, also there's the idea of trying to get what we're trying to do, the essential ideas of our building, yeah. across to the jury, uh, the people who are um, who we basically present to. Um, mm -hmm. And my building is made up of these um, basically links that mm -hmm. connect to each other on uh, via a system of ramps on the inside of the building, mm -hmm. and you can see with these little with these, each of these spaces kind of are at offsets according to the, the level of the ramp. And I wanted to emphasize that these links are kind of their own spaces, but still kind of connected, but you don't know how. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the idea um, cool. of this image here. We had a question from the audience, like Matt was asking, uh, how do you line up the photos with your, your Revit model? Yeah, that's kind of an interesting one. So if I have a photo, how do I scale it, line it up? Do you have any tricks in terms of like uh, how you get you make those things look good together? Uh, well, you, it requires a little bit of knowledge about the camera that you're actually using to take uh, a photo of, your, of the, the real site. Um, mm -hmm. I used a camera that, that, whose field of view is approximately 70 degrees. It's, it's mm -hmm. wide angle. And so in, um, in 3DS, and I, I'm pretty sure in Revit you could adjust this also, 
um, you can adjust the field of view. So um, you can either approximate it to the size of the photo, and or you can in 3ds there's an option where you can change the actual angle of view. I, I set it to about 70, and um, mm, to try and match the photo. Okay, cool. exactly, and, and the approximate elevation of where it was shot. Um, but but also there, it requires a little bit of tweaking on the uh, on the photo part because um, I don't want to bend my building around to conform it to the photo. Um, mm -hmm. So what I did was I kind of adjusted the image um, using a little bit of Photoshop to make sure that the that my render lined up with the um, actual photo. Fantastic! Fantastic! Let's scroll on down. That was actually kind of a really cool one too. Um, so these are great. In terms of like, uh, yeah. So the again, sort of very other projects of the like the the smaller scale project. You mean? Yeah, I guess that was uh, yeah, it was it was that house project you were showing me. Yep, that was it. Uh, it was the competition, um, and yeah, so there was this competition that we had. It was a, an eleven day competition, um, and we had to present a uh, a board and a model. Uh, at the end, and um, so this one I used Revit for mine, and the rendered section cut that I did using 3ds Max, um, and basically I applied the materials in Revit, um, just this this kind of wood texture and the, the general concrete texture in Revit, and then I um, in 3ds there is a slice tool, and what you do is you just select all your geometry. And you apply the slice modifier, and then you can remove um, one side of the slice or the other to kind of just basically show you mm -hmm. a section cut. And then I, mm -hmm. I rendered that, and then just put some lines over in Illustrator, and there's my section cut. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. That is kind of like the section box in Rabbit, right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, pretty much exactly like that. Um, it's not quite as easy to use as the section box in Revit, um, but I. Um, and more, and I feel like I enjoy rendering in 3ds Max a little more. Yeah. It's got a bit more customization, uh, so that's why I use it. Fantastic! Yeah, we had another question that came in, sort of about the uh, images and things like that. Like when we do go ahead and like uh, kind of work with the image and we put it behind the model, you know, it's sort of this issue: can you actually see the image behind the model? So. It's you know it's almost like a layering thing in terms of you know I'm not sure if the model had holes or we could see it through the windows or we just want to hide kind of the front part. So Matt, actually, if you you, know, you want more clarification, go ahead and like uh, you know, kind of add a little clarification so I can help ask a better question for you. Um, so it you mean why doesn't the image show up behind the building like here or how can there be like um, transparency such as windows? Yes. Yeah. I, my guessing is that it's more the issue of if there is transparency or something we would see through. You kind of have this issue of it, you know, it's really it's an interesting layering issue about what's in the foreground, what's in the background, and how to sort of show things through the model. Um, well, for like transparency, um, there is an option once you once you do your render in 3ds, um, you can save it as an image like a, a TIFF or a ping. And either either of those file formats actually saves the alpha. And mm -hmm. if there's a window next to just open air, it'll tint the background behind the window, but it'll still show through as a, a tinted transparent kind of a material. So if you go to any image editor, you can throw a background in behind it, and it'll show that degree of transparency that the window mm -hmm. gives versus just open air. Cool. Okay, so now really, I guess the the question that Matt's asking is really he he's wanting to see the model so they can get the right angle and view for the render to kind of line up with a photo. So it's almost like it's it's sort of an interesting uh, how do you want the photo and then you sort of want to get the model oriented just right relative to the photo so that when you do the rendering of the model and it gets layered on top of the photo, yeah, so I can see the camera in the correct spot to match the photo. And I guess, you know, to your point, Chris, it was almost like it's, it helps a, ton, a lot to know sort of where the photo was actually taken. Because exactly. if you do know where the photo was taken, then we can adjust the camera position in Revit or in 3ds Max to go ahead and pull it to approximately the same location as the camera location 
at which point, but you, you did say there is a, and I'm, you know much more about 3ds Max. There's a tool in 3ds Max for helping us line that up. The photo, um, there, or yeah. Uh, well, it's pretty much, um, I guess, what I would call semi eyeballing it. Okay, <laughs> um, that's that's fair. Uh, we've got a site plan of of our um, of the basically the Pittsburgh area, and we use that site plan to generate a digital site plan. Um, mm -hmm. And then that included the just the, the pop-outs of the sidewalks, the the massing of the buildings that surround it, and um, so I positioned the camera on the sidewalk just mm -hmm. across the street, and uh, and then I referenced the the actual photo that I took, and then refined it based off of that. Um, pretty much was my uh, my workflow for that. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, Actually, let's. Then I have a yes. tutorial exactly about how to match the. You do? Well, point us to it. We're, we're anxiously awaiting. Yeah, uh, I, I can show that really quick. Uh, the sure. So, so go ahead and like, uh, yeah, Chris, why don't you go ahead and release the screen on your side, and let's see if we can turn it back over to Ming. Yeah, I, I, I will give it back to you uh, super fast. Oh, no worries. You, you hang on. We're, we're going to wrap up here fairly shortly. So this is, I'm going to this, um, encourage people online to kind of you know send in those last so some more questions that you want to get answered, and we'll we'll kind of move on to our kind of closing topics. Yeah, this is actually a really old school technique. I think it's, it's kind of uh, uh, identical for Maya and Max as well. So the first thing you'll see is a picture I took in my backyard. Mm -hmm. Then I bring that image as a backdrop in Maya program. Mm -hmm. So here I create three digital marks. Uh, trying to make one mark match with the one in the picture. Mm -hmm. Then the third step is you want to kind of change your view um, angles, you want to change the lens. Just as Chris has mentioned, you have to make some tweaking, some eyeball manual mm -hmm. process. So as a result, you have these three digital marks in front of the, uh, 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 the picture. Mm -hmm. Then you can render multiple paths. So this is the first path is about this general diffuse light. Uh, this one is about the key light, which gives you this really uh, uh, rigid hard surface. Then I can render another layer at the z-depth uh, mm -hmm. to show the, the focal point. Uh, I can render the reflections. I can render the shadows. I can render wow. the uh, ambient occlusion. And then this layer will be composed together in Photoshop. And then I will use the Photoshop layer to kind of manipulate the saturation per layer. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. some of the background is if it's oversaturated, I can make it match with my digital renderings. Mm -hmm. And here's the result. Fantastic. Uh, this, this picture, there is a two marks are digital. There is one is real from the picture. And I'd, I'd have a very hard time guessing which one's which. Yeah, I am, I am totally in awe. So thank you for like sharing that tutorial and really for a lot of the stuff, you know, there's only so much we can like cover in a very short period of time here. But like, uh, like go out and like, yeah, both Chris's site as well as Ming's site. In fact, we should go ahead and post, uh, you know, the comedy of my own team here, post the URLs to those things. So in the follow-up notes for this presentation, like uh, we'll post those links so that people can actually uh, like uh, find your sites and actually get out there and kind of take a look at those. Okay. Very good. And in, in terms of sort of just wrapping today, because, you know, oh, we're going to be at the top of the hour fairly quickly here, you know, I'd love to kind of think about just really if, you know, oh, what's, Matt's asking, one more, what, what's the website for the tutorial? So, Ming, what, what's your uh, website? Uh, uh, it's Ming3D.com. So, Ming3D.com. And yes. uh, I can post a link later in uh, Facebook. Okay, no worries. Okay, we'll go ahead and get that to you. So just in terms of as we're, as we're wrapping here, because we, there's a lot of cool things we can be doing with visualization, we really wanted to do more new thing in this is really kind of give people an idea of where you know, visualization's going and how we're, we're changing the way we use it. It's not just for creating these little static images at the tail end of the process, that you're sort of more involved, kind of incorporating visualization early on just to inform your design process the entire time and all the way through. So, like, you know, Chris, do you have any, like, relative to sort of what you're seeing in studios and what people are trying to do with uh, visualization, do you have any advice for, like, other students about, you know, just really how to get started, how they should be approaching visualization? Um, well, for me, it um, takes a lot of just kind of playing around and see what you can do. Maybe not during the crunch time of your project. Maybe 
that might Clearly, not, the best not on that last time. night. <laughs> yeah, that might not be the best time to, to, to open up a new program, but um, maybe during the presentation week, I don't know, um, that's when you have some downtime that you can reopen that model and then just say, let's see if I can get some some light bounces to work. Let's see if I can get some of this reflection to, to look, you know, cool or something. Um, Fantastic. So that's just kind of jump in. It, it seems, I understand it may seem a bit intimidating. I talk to um, my classmates and they say, oh, I don't want to start 3ds Max because it, it's so many features. I don't know what to do. It, there's always some place to start. There's always tutorials online. Um, I can't just, I can't emphasize enough. Just play, just play around with it. I think it's a really good point. You know, it's, it's, it's intimidating, I think, when you first get going, thinking, oh, my God, I really have to go through and create these, you know, stellar images. And really, you know, a lot of the best sort of communication doesn't have to be stellar image-like, but it's just, you know, moving from just sort of those shaded views within Revit to just a little bit of kind of understanding the real textures and materials and the light quality, you know, I think really takes it very far. It's a very high early game. You know, you don't have to be expert at it, but you can achieve an awful lot pretty quickly. Actually, Ming, from your perspective, you know, as you think about your students that you're working with in your studios, like, you know, what would you advise students in terms of you know, how they should get started or really, you know, how they should focus their energy or think about visualization as part of the process? Yeah, uh, a couple of things I want to share. In terms of the visualization, you should always think about who is your audience, who is trying to represent this uh, content to. Second is about the timing, is what time or when you should start to render the, the images. And the third one, the most important one, is the knowledge you learned uh, in one program, for example, in Revit, can be easily translated into other programs. So mm -hmm. you have a good understanding about daylighting system, you know, how the solar angles is going to affect the shadow. The things you learn in Revit can be easily adapted to 3ds Max or to Maya. So it's not mm -hmm. from zero. You can always have this already knowledge building other programs. Yeah. Have the in fact, that's, I think, one of the, the nicest things about, in recent years, how so many of the products have been integrated into suites. You know, things like uh, the, the, the basic sort of the sun path tool and how that's become unified. Or even now, one of the big changes in 2013, people probably haven't discovered it yet, is that the material library is now unified. So the materials you're looking at in Revit, the materials you're looking at in Showcase, the materials you're looking at in 3ds Max, the same materials. And it's a small change, but it's actually sort of a big change in terms of rendering to make sure that you can have works flow smoothly from one program to another. Absolutely. It makes the whole flow so consistent. Fantastic. Okay, well, let's go ahead and we'll, we'll pretty much put a wrap on this. What I just want to let go, I'll, I'll do one last thing just to kind of help people in terms of uh, understanding where they can get to these things. If you go no place else after this, go to students.autodesk.com where you can go ahead and download all this software. So if you want to go ahead and take a look at Revit and get the latest version of that or 3ds Max, oh, where did it go? There it is. We also have Showcase up there, just really the entire suite, as well as Maya, okay, one of Ming's favorite tools. Yeah, the whole suite of things is available up there. Go ahead and expand that. You can download now. Of course, I have to sign in if I'm going to do that. But uh, yeah, get access to this software. You're going to get a license that will typically last for three years, and you can just start doing fantastic things. There's no reason that software should be a barrier to you because software is available. We have a lot of tutorials online that Autodesk supplies as well as just if you go out and just search on Google or on YouTube, you can find an incredible wealth of this stuff. Or at Ming's site or at Chris's site, there's an awful lot of good information out there for you to draw on to help yourself get started. So I just encourage you to go ahead and get started with it all today and just really play with this and start developing your skills and see how far you can take it. Okay, let's go ahead. We'll wrap it for today. And then in terms of so people who are watching the webcast series know in two weeks we'll be back with yet another one. We're going to go ahead and be looking at some sustainability issues and looking at oh, the sorry and Ecotech and how some of the new features in Revit help us understand energy analysis and, and understanding our sustainability features. So uh, come on back in two more weeks and we'll bring together another interesting group of people featuring, oh, we've got Matt Jezik, who's one of the project managers on the, the Vasari team. 
team, as well as uh, Ian Single, who's one of our student experts for New, New Jersey Institute of Technology. He'll be talking about his experience in terms of doing a solar house project. So a lot of cool stuff out there to hopefully like uh, share useful information. Thank you for everyone who's been online in terms of asking questions and stuff like that. This is exactly what we want to have happen. It's all about just bringing interesting people to you and giving you a chance to answer your questions and ask questions and just have a discussion. So thank you so much for participating on your end. We really appreciate it, and we hope to keep it going. So let's go ahead and wrap it for today. Thank you all for joining us, and you guys take care.